All right. I will say welcome back to another episode of All About Balance. And today I am back with my other two MMA musketeers, Mr. Jack Sear and Mr. Sean McGuinness. Gentlemen, how are you doing? Good evening. Great. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, we are here today to review the UFC 250 card that happened this past weekend. Um, gentlemen, did you watch it? Did you watch it live or did you, did you watch it afterwards? Yeah, I, I stayed up for it. Um, I was I was babysitting my my uh, my son. I was I was introducing him to to the UFC. I think this is actually the second or third one we've we've stayed up for now. Um, <laughs> I regret not. I, I had a serious conversation with myself before the main event as to whether or not it'd be worth staying up for. And um, yeah, I made a bad decision there. I I sat through the twenty five minutes. John. Yeah, luckily for that one, I watched it the next day. I think. Um, yeah, I think if I'd gotten to to the main event, even the next day when I watched it in, you know, with sort of full energy, that was still kind of kind of painful and sad. But um, but the rest of the the main card, though, you know, if I'd watched that live, that would have been awesome. Yeah, so I um, I watched the fights a couple of days after, and I've now watched Amanda Nunes and Felicia Spencer. Where let's start there, but I've watched that fight twice, and it doesn't get any better. Um. So let's let's start there. So uh, one of one of the most one-sided title fights we've ever seen in UFC history. Yeah, you've got to think so, haven't you? Um, I think to be fair, as much as you know, we're probably going to end up talking down aspects of this fight. So I think it did show something about that division in particular, which is yeah. a little bit concerning in terms of how sh- just how shallow it is. Um, but, you know, I'll start with some of the positives. Amanda Nunes, for all intents and purposes, did look amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one thing that surprised me is I felt like the fight was going the way that I sort of thought it was going to go, but I never sort of imagined Amanda was just going to Uchi Mata, you know. Phenomenal. Here and there. Yeah, and then from there, just dominate her everywhere else. I think my takeaway from it, which, you know, I think is – all of our issues is there was such a large disparity between um, sort of challenger and champion. Mm-hmm. And I think it just comes from that 145 pound division. It's so young that you're getting some people that are being thrust into title shots that just shouldn't. Mm-hmm. Like, um, mm-hmm. do you remember that lady that fought Cyborg? Um, she was maybe like Cyborg's second defense and her nickname was Soccer Mom. Uh, Tanya Revenger. Not Tanya. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, Tonya Revenger is legit. Like, Tonya Revenger has been in the UFC before. She was in Invicta and then she fought Cyborg. But, yeah, I mean... I, I still think, though, but again, Felicia was, te- was... Like, she was legit. But I just think for some of these girls going up, there's such a leap in skill level when they're meeting those champions. And yeah. the gap between number one and number two is just huge at the moment. I mean, I'm looking at my notes now. And, and, and actually, I'll, I'll bring reference to one of the things I said in the group chat is that watching this fight was was like me rolling with Jack. Like, it's just nowhere close ever, right? Like, the start of the fight happened, and and Spencer looked strong. Like, physically, she looked strong and imposing. Smaller than Amanda, but she looked strong. And then within the first 15 seconds, I've written, like, oh, no. Oh, no, this isn't going to be good. Like, lateral movement, head movement non-existent. Amanda was popping out a nice jab, caught her early with like a, a one, two and a left hook. And I was like, Oh Jesus. Like there was just zero roll. And, and inside a minute, the next note I've written is, well, Felisa Spencer's very game though. <laughs> like she's very game. And I think if that's your main attribute in a title fight, it's not going to go well. Right, Jack? Yeah. I, I was an, optimist about Felicia's chances based purely on the durability um, she showed in that cyborg fight and, and ultimately was right about um, her being able to go five rounds with Amanda. She's tough um, as fuck, mate. Yeah, but I am, um, whilst I was kind of an optimist there, I'm, I'm a pessimist in terms of looking back at that fight. I thought that it sucked for several reasons. Um, I thought that I thought the judging sucked. I I, I cannot believe that only one that there was only one round scored a 10-8 I didn't think any of the rounds were even competitive enough to be a 10-9 um, I thought that it was a disappointing performance from Felicia's corner not to halt the fight after the fourth I thought there was an opportunity to do in the third but I thought okay the fourth was 
she finished on her back. She was getting smashed. I thought this is, this is an appropriate time to call it off. And they didn't. And whilst, whilst Amanda never really had to, um, while she never really encountered any kind of strong offense from Felicia, I actually thought it was a poor performance from, from her. I think Mm -hmm. when there's such a skill disparity and when you clearly have gas left in the tank, I think there should have been a far more concerted effort from her to try and get this to try and get this finished. And so I, I actually I think have a were... thought about that. I actually have a thought about that. So I think there's a couple of things at play here. Like I genuinely feel like Amanda Nunes liked Felicia Spencer slash likes her because I felt there was a few times in that fight when she caught Felicia and hurt her badly. And usually we see Amanda Nunes going for the kill there, but didn't. The fourth and the fifth round, Amanda Nunes certainly took off. You know, fourth, she was laying the smack down. But the fifth, she essentially just laid in her her clothes guard and was happy to be there knowing she'd won the fight, right? She wasn't tired. None of that. The other thing I was wondering was whether whether Amanda just wanted the cage time, been out of the cage for a little bit of time, not been training properly. Because to me, this looked like a spa for Amanda Nunes. It didn't look much more than that, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it was very similar to the Raquel Pennington fight where she, mm. there was such a skill difference, she didn't really need to put a pace on her. Um, and whereas the Raquel Pennington fight, a, fear, a finish materialised because, um, because of the consistent leg kicks, right? Um, and there wasn't necessarily um, that kind of opportunity for her here. But yeah, I think being the champion that she is, the fact that she was clearly... Um, messing around I felt not necessarily in terms of technically but you saw her smiling in the fight she was taking it very easy I felt that given the skill gap um, and given the positions that she was in in the fight I I would have expected more of an effort for for her to try and put her stamp on the fight and and get a finish. John? Yeah um, yeah I agree I think the other issue that sort of comes with that and I'm not I'm not sure whether this is Amanda's approach or whether it was in my opinion, I think Felicia was just tough enough to take those shots very well. But oh, it leads man. you to this dilemma like we had with Anthony Smith like a couple of um, weeks ago where the fighter's doing just enough to stay in there, but in the same breath are taking ridiculous amounts of damage. But because it's just enough, the referee can't really sort of stand in because according to the criteria, they're safe. But, you know, like Jack said, that's where I think the corner has to come in. And I think corners in general in MMA, they've got to get better at throwing in the towel, you know, in those sort of scenarios. Yeah. Like, you know, you're fighting better than anyone if you're in the corner. And surely after all, you know, like you said, even before round four, she was just completely outclassed. You know, it should have been obvious that it was time to throw the towel in. I agree. My, the last sentence that I have here in my, in my notes for round three was absolutely ferocious outside trip takedown. Like she literally just dropped it on the back of her head and was like, what? And then I've put Amanda is considerably up the volume in the third and Felicia is under constant overwhelming pressure, taking an absolute beating and this fight is over. Like to me, the end of the third was enough. It was enough, you know, there was I, I I honestly it was upsetting to me to watch the fourth and the fifth. I didn't need to see it. Um yeah, yeah, Jesus. I mean, how many single legs in MMA do you see? Single leg run the pipes. Outside of DC, not many. Right, not many. And Amanda took one like she was taking candy from a child. Like it wasn't <laughs> even close. Like it was not close. And, and look, there were some positives for Felicia Spencer, right? Outside of the toughness, there was some positives. She caught Amanda with some, some relatively nice counters. There were few and far between, but she did catch them. Um, although her striking is very rudimentary, her footwork needs a lot of work. Uh, Amanda was, was out, out footworking her, if that's the correct term, constantly. You know, when, when Amanda switched southpaw, she made sure that her, her lead foot was on the outside. When she was fighting orthodox, she made sure she was marrying up with her back foot really well. And she was just cutting the cage off from Felisa so, so well. And, and the constant range control that Amanda showed was just beautiful. Felicia was always under pressure, but not necessarily getting hit. No way out. And, and what we saw from Felicia is she returned to her A game, which was she would bull rush into a, into some form of clinch. 
generally should get taken down. But, but you know, what I did see was some, some nice recoveries of guard, not many, but some. Um, and, and in that fifth round, whether Nunez allowed it or not, you know, she got to close guard. She, she broke her posture. She landed some of her own strikes. She was battered and bruised by that point. But, but look, I mean, as, as you alluded to before, like, to be honest, in the fourth and the fifth round, the only thing I really wrote down was what I really want to see now is Shevchenko put some muscle and size on and go and fight Amanda because I think that would be a barn burner. But, but other than that, you know, it was, just, it was just sad to watch. Like, it was sad, sad to watch. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people are going to be clamouring for the trilogy fight with Shevchenko. Yeah. The other two haven't been spectacular. And I think that now Amanda has been up to featherweight as well. She's probably put on a little bit more mass. And, and I think yeah. that that size gap between them is probably, it's probably grown. Um, I think that um, the kind of the one positive I took away from this is that Amanda's going to have the rest of the year off. She's probably going to go have a baby. And I think that whilst there isn't a, a plethora of contenders waiting for her, um, I think we've seen that Irene Aldana is going to be fighting Holly Holm with a, with a good win fight. there. She, she could potentially be in, uh, she could be next in line. And, and we've also got Aspen Ladd and Juliana Pena coming up as well. So hopefully there's like a mini tournament between them um, mm. and we get a clear cut number one contender for, for when Amanda returns. Yeah, I mean, the last thing I want to see is Megan Anderson fighting for that 145 belt. Yeah, please. please. I, just, I don't even uh, like seeing her fight anyway, let alone against Megan. Yeah, Lady. not for a belt. Not for not a belt. Lady. I'd say she's about five years away from a belt. If ever. <laughs> sure. I mean, I mean, there's things that, that, that there are some really Im- impressive physical aspects to Megan Anderson. She's long, she's big, she looks powerful, she's got good kicks, but uh, aside from that, it's not great. Like it's not great. Um, so if everyone's happy, let's move on. Uh, we'll move on to to, to Cody and Asuncao. So, oh, Jesus, uh, Sean, take this away and let's see if we um, if we agree. Yeah, um, I thought this was brilliant. Um, I thought really? as well. It, yeah, yeah. What? So Garbrandt and Asuncao. Yeah, we are talking about the same fight. Yeah, yeah I love yeah, it, yeah. mate. You know. Um, you know how you've got those memes on Instagram where it's like sort of C-level Kane and um, sort of motivated BJ Penn, like all the prime version of the fighters. I feel like Team Wolf Cody Garbrandt is going to be a new guy thrown into that mix. Like, oh I am God. completely on board with everything this guy's doing oh, now. Man. But, um, but I, I thought it was good. I thought before it, my main things going in were, you know, he's a counter fighter. If he plays sort of conservative, and let's Rafael come to him. He's going to be one of the first people that finishes him for a long time. And, you know, that was what, what ended up happening. Um, in terms of the actual knockout itself, um, you know, there's a lot of talks of whether that's better than what Sean O'Malley did sort of below him. Um, and I thought just the sort of bar fight-esque sort of um, way that punch was thrown sort of. Fucking awful. Yeah, yeah. But one, one thing I will say as well, another thing with Cody, like we've all spoke about his counter punching a lot. Another thing that made me realize that how stupid it was for him to get into those brawls previously is just how much faster he is than a lot of the guys that he's fighting against. You know, like, especially as the faster guy, you have no incentive whatsoever to stand and trade with people. And I think with Rafael Sunsa, we noticed that. And also in the interview that he gave afterwards, he sort of, um, you know, gave a little bit of notice towards that issue he's had in his previous fight. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested to hear what you guys didn't like about this one. I was, I was all above the. Maybe it's the so, hairstyle. I can't see. Now, I mean, look, I can't talk, right? But, but that guy has some, some exceedingly interesting hair. I um, loved his hair. It's great. I was actually disappointed with Cody Gargarant. I was actually disappointed. Now, as disappointed as I can be with a man that finishes a Sun Tzu, but the first 15 seconds, first 15 to 30 seconds, I was like, oh my God, a Sun Tzu looks like he's wearing lead shoes. Like he was all over the place slow. His, his feints were awful. Like he was leaning forward, like he was getting blown over by the wind. Like he, he just seemed all over the place. And, and now, to give credit to Asuncao, what possibly could have been happening there is he could have been trying to, to set the pace. I thought Asuncao actually did quite well at trying to control the pace early on in the fight. Um, and I think Cody did really well by uh, using his leg kicks, 
uh, by, you know, using his jab, being out of range, making sure that, you know, he, he had the chance to blitz in when he wanted to. Um, but I don't know. I felt like Cody wasn't really doing much in the first round. I thought he was countering well, but I felt like he could have taken the fight to a Sun Tzu a little bit more and tried to break a Sun Tzu's range a little bit more. What I did feel is there was a couple of times when they got into the pocket together and there was a, a wild exchange of hooks from both sides and it just felt like at any moment Cody was just going to get rocked and knocked out. But then the second round, Cody really turned it on. I think he hurt a Sun Tzu late in the first or caught us on Saturday late in the first. And something I thought was really interesting that Cody did was he backed himself to the, to the cage at the end of the first and the end of the second, and that's obviously how he got the finish. Um, but what I said in my notes for the second is the Sun Sal was just doing a lot of nothing. And whilst it's smart enough waiting for Cody to come into the pocket, he shouldn't be trading with a guy like Cody in the pocket, even though it's Cody. He's just so much faster, so much more powerful. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just felt that, I felt like I wanted to see more from Cody. I felt like he was nervous. He was, he was, you know, tentative. But when it came, fuck me, you know, Jesus Christ, he, he put that guy to sleep, right? I felt that as someone who's a, a, an avid Cody hater, I tried to like his performance. Um, I thought when he wasn't skipping around on the floor like a twat, I thought the addition of the low leg kicks were, were pretty nice. Um, yeah, the low leg kick was really nice, actually. I felt that, other than that, though, he, you, other than the brief slip um, midway through the second from a Sun Tzu, which did look like it landed, to be fair, I felt like you could have made a case that a Sun Tzu was winning that as well. It was, it was a pretty 50-50 fight. Um, it was um, encouraging seeing Cody not bomb forward into the pocket blindly um, after he stunned a Sun Tzu. Um, but ultimately, I didn't... I didn't see anything there that made me think that, that he could pick up the strap again. I think that it was a very cagey performance against someone who doesn't have a ton of firepower, um, someone who he had a significant speed advantage over. Um, and yeah, whilst I was, um, whilst I definitely would have liked to have seen a Sunset spring, spring the upset here, I take solace in the fact that we're probably going to see Cody get flatlined again. I think that division is just full of too many killers, um, too much firepower and, and yeah. I, whilst it was, uh, if you're a Cody fan, I can see why you're encouraged. Um, ultimately, I, I find it hard to believe that, that he'll hold the belt again. I think my problem is, is that I am a Cody fan in terms of his fighting style, but I wasn't encouraged. Like, he's been with Mark Henry for a little while, and although he seemed to stick to a game plan more, I just didn't see much that was new. His footwork was very similar. The way he approached his boxing styles was similar. Sean, go on. Let it go. Go on. Get it out there. Come on. No, no, no. I was, I was just going to say that, you know, one thing I find interesting is this idea that, you know, before Cody was sort of bringing the fight to everyone, I think if, if, even if you look at his most exciting fights and he's knocked people out, what happens before is very similar to what happened in the Sunset fight. Like, he's very measured. He stays at a distance. He's not the most exciting guy up until he gets the finish, if, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, and in terms of, of new aspects to his game, and, and st I think one reason Rafael Sunsau was struggling to do a lot was because I think those low leg kicks really just destroyed his leg, you know, in maybe the first round, I think that was gone. And if you've ever taken any of those, once oh, those yeah, nerves awesome. switched off, you, you just can't even feel your feet anymore, you know. And Hafel's a Sun Sao is a guy that really relies on his base and his stance, you know, and it's probably one of the reasons he doesn't get knocked out very often. I think that was more, for me anyway, looking at it, I think it was more those kicks sort of being added in that led to um, a Sun Sao not being able to mount the same sort of offense. I've got to say one thing. There was a really, really lovely scramble. Um, I can't remember exactly who took the back, but I think somebody took the back where there was a drop maybe in the first, like early second. And there was a really nice scramble. It went from front headlock and then Asante rolled to try and get the back. Cody got up. That was really nice. But yeah, I mean, look, I, I would like to see what Cody looks like in the next couple of fights. I definitely don't want to see him racing to a title again. I think allow him to build his confidence, give him somebody of a similar ilk. Like I don't want to see Aljamain Sterling, Cody Garbrandt next. I don't really want to see Corey Sandhagen Cody Garbrandt next, but somebody just below that, I'd like to see that. 
and then let's see what he looks like. Because you're right, he's not always somebody that pushes forward, pushes the fight. But I felt like in the first 30 seconds, you could see that Cody had the opportunity to do that against the Sun Sao. And I would have liked to see him push the pace a little bit more than he did. What about someone like Sean O'Malley? No. Oh my I think Sean O'Malley, I think he's the, the worst matchup. The worst I think star for, matchup. Both, for both of those guys, that's a prospect killing yeah. matchup right now. Long, but Obviously, Jack rangy. wants the destruction of Cody's career. Look, he does. Look but... at that smile. He, he just wants his career to be, so that's why he wants a match to be short. How about we'll flip this around and we'll give Cody Eddie Wineland. How about that? <laughs> Oops. I would rather yeah. not. Leave, leave yeah. poor, poor Eddie to rest in peace. He's, <laughs> apparently, he still hasn't woken. He still, he's still I, I don't think he has. Before. I say that. Did you see a Sun Tso after the, the knockout? He tried yeah, to stand. He, he tried that to stand and he just didn't look like he had any legs. Oh, mate, yeah. that was gross. Um, so, I'm going to hand the next one over to Sean, Aljamain Sterling, Corey Sandhagen. Now, I, w- I want you to talk about the, the technical things that you saw out of this fight, Sean. So if you want to take us away. Yeah. Um, so I think it, it actually had a few interesting things in common with the Herbert Burns fight, um, I thought. The main thing that I wanted to talk about with this one is the, the body triangle. Um, and so for anyone listening to this, obviously the body triangles when you're in back control and you sort of lock your legs um, in the triangle position. But one thing that, um, Al Jermaine did that was interesting and what you see a lot of MMA fighters doing is locking the triangle on the wrong side um, or wrong supposedly side. the wrong side um, in jiu-jitsu um, and if you look at this is very hard to describe in a podcast sort of format but if you go and watch Al Jermaine and Herbert Burns they both deliberately lock on that side because it gives them the option to come up on top whereas in jiu-jitsu Coming, on, coming up on top isn't there's not as much incentive there just because if you lose the position in jiu-jitsu you know you've not lost points for that it's just a reversal whereas in MMA you could get knocked out or lose the whole fight um, so it's quite a difficult position to sort of explain over a podcast and I'm hoping at some point um, I could sort of slap some videos together to sort of show the differences there but in terms of just a general thing on this fight this really surprised me. My pick was nowhere near close on this one at all. Um, I thought it was going to be a lot bigger. One thing I'll, I'll really tip my hat um, to you, Harry, on this is sort of drawing the attention to the smaller cage beforehand. Because um, I think there are a few fights, but especially this one, in my opinion, the cage played a huge factor. I felt like Corey had him back to the fence from the word go. Um, and he threw that body kick, and from there, he, he was just he was just one step behind the whole way, really. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, Jack. Do you want to take us away, and I'll see if there's anything I can add at the end? Yeah, I definitely feel like we overlooked that as a group. I think we all ended up picking Sandhagen, um, and I think that's because his style is probably a little bit sexier as well, so I think we were probably naturally drawn towards him. Um, I think that a couple of other, other kind of key elements that we overlooked from breaking this down was I think they, the UFC flipped up a metric before the fight began, and Sandhagen's takedown defense was like 27%. Oh, um, Jesus. Which really? is a massive red flag, especially when you're going against someone like Aljo. Um, and to add to that as well, I, I saw an interview with Aljo um, just before the fight as well. Um, the interviewer was basically pressing him on why he didn't wrestle at all during the Pedro Munoz match. Um, and it's because he had like a lingering wrist or hand injury. And he said that now that was fixed, he would, he would be back to grappling as well. So, yeah, I think the one of the things I commented on, on the last podcast, right, is, is when we get a, a matchup that I kind of deem to be dead even, normally I favour the superior wrestler or grappler and completely shot myself in the foot by, by going away from that on this one. Yeah, well, we all picked Sandhagen for a unanimous decision, so we all fucked up that massively. But the thing that, that I thought was, this was a perfect example of the smaller cage, right? Because as soon as they touched hands, and, and this, is, I thought, was actually where the fight was lost, if I'm truly honest, is or the beginning of the end is the very start. Sandhagen walked forward really gingerly, really slowly, with his hand outstretched to touch Aljo's hands. Aljo was already on the offensive. He was, he was already in stance and he was moving very quickly towards Sandhagen. He touched his hands almost like a jab, and then he started moving towards him. Sandhagen threw a body kick and a head kick, and that was literally all it had. You know, he was up against the fence. He was pushing him back. 
and, and he was keeping him restricted on his footwork. And I thought what Aljo did was so brilliant. Lots of stance switches, a low swan, stance, and pressured Cody as much as possible, Co Corey, sorry, it, so that he, Corey couldn't get his footwork off. He couldn't move off like he usually does. He couldn't get his offense started. He couldn't start the footwork. He couldn't start his dance. And as soon as he could, Aljo was straight in there on the back, and that was literally all she wrote, right? Like, what was so beautiful about the actual finish as well is it was similar to Herbert Burns's finish. And that was that he had the, the, the triangle on the quote unquote wrong side. But what I thought was quite interesting is, and again, this is difficult to explain over a podcast, but, but he switched the triangle from underneath the leg on the outside to putting it inside of the legs. And then as he wanted to turn uh, Sandhagen, he actually switched it to the inside of the other leg so it was difficult for Sandhagen when he did get rolled onto his front or onto his back for him to posture off that leg because Aljo had a hook essentially on the inside of his right leg. And as he was rolling, Aljo managed to slip a one arm choke in. And by that time, it was way too late. I mean, the squeeze that Aljo must have with just one arm must be phenomenal. The second arm comes in and, and that's all she wrote. And I mean, I think that it was a great performance from Aljo, but I think he has dodged a really, really, really good fighter in Corey Sandhagen. And I mean, sure, Corey Sandhagen clearly has some some grappling chops to, to brush up on, but but man, what a performance by Aljo, right? Yeah, I think that there was a lot of impressive performances across the course of the night. But I agree. For me, that was that that was the that was the standout leader. So we will move on to a card at a card, a fight that I thought was not going to, to do much, but actually it was a it was a decent enough fight. Um Magni versus Rocco Martin. Uh, Magni wins by unanimous decision, and I think rightly so. Um does anyone have any any problems with the decision? When no. I was watching it live, I was leaning Martin. However, when the third round concluded because of how close it was and because I, I, I never find myself rooting for a fighter whose strategy is to go out there, secure the first two rounds and then just hang on in the third. Um, whilst I thought live scoring at the time, I thought Martin had done enough to take the first two rounds, mainly because of the control against the cage, a couple of takedowns. Um, I was not annoyed at all that, that Neil Magny won that. Um, yeah, one of those decisions where happy, happy to see it go either way. Sean? Sure. Yeah, I think the third round was huge to me, to be honest. Um, me too. I think in any Could have been a 10-8. Yeah, it's why sometimes I, I sort of like um, the idea of that pride rule set that they score over the course of the whole fight kind of thing because I thought those first two rounds were so close that it was basically whoever came out in that third um, you know, and really put on a performance was going to take it for me there. I mean, to be honest, I actually scored it for Magni three out of three rounds. The reasons why I did that, I thought that whilst um, in round one, whilst uh, Anthony Martin was able to, to hold Magni up against the cage, he didn't actually do anything there. Like there, was, there wasn't many strikes landed. There was a couple of knees, but nothing major. He wasn't able to advance his position. He wasn't able to get Magni down. And Magni was able to not really perform any reversals, but he would get out eventually. And I thought that Magni's leg kicks... And his, his, his volume in striking, like Rocco wasn't able to put many combinations up, but Magni was able to put more combinations than Rocco was. So I gave it to, to, to Magni for that one. And for the second one, although uh, Rocco Martin came out, tried to land hard, he swung a lot in the first sort of 30 seconds and he managed to get the takedown. Again, he wasn't able to advance his position. He wasn't able to land much ground and pound. And Magni used um, dogfight really, really well to get back up to his feet. Um, and I think Magni actually took Rocco down. Um, yeah, he did. He then got his own offensive wrestling. And, and I just thought that, that Magni's footwork was the tail of this fight. And I know I, I talk about footwork and I don't want to seem like Dom Cruz, but, but Magni's footwork was, was just better. Like Rocco seemed to be a lot of one-shot swings. Whereas, and, and obviously some, some decent cage wrestling and, and Sean, don't hurt me, but, but, you know, then the third round came and, and, and that was it. Rocco was tired and, and Magni just teed off essentially. So, so I, I had, I had no problems with the decision to be honest. Um, but yeah, fuck you, Jack, for picking Rocco Martin. Um, we'll move on to, uh, we'll move on to the Sean O'Malley uh, chase. Are we keeping fight. track of these scores, by the way? 
Yeah, yeah, I've got them here. So, so oh. just so we just so we go out, uh, me and Sean absolutely bottled the first fight. We went Nunes by KO. Jack rightly called it uh, unanimous decision to Nunes. Oh, God. Jack then comes out with a Sansal via KO. So I mean, oh. Jesus Christ! Um, I called Garbrandt unanimous decision. You called Garbrandt KO. So. Congratulations to you. Uh, Thank you. Thank Sand you. We all went Sandhagen unanimous decision, so we all fucked that one. Um, Bunch of shitheads on that. Yeah, yeah, it was awful. Me and Sean went Magni by unanimous decision. You went unanimous decision for um, for Martin. Uh, you've both schooled me on this O'Malley fight, going for a KO. I thought he'd do something flashy and get a submission, but I mean, he obviously saw my pick and decided to do something different. So fuck Sean O'Malley at the end of the day. Uh, but yeah, let, let's talk about that. I mean. In the group chat, you guys were saying that you felt that Eddie Wineland was doing well in the first throws. I did not see anything of that form whatsoever. Uh, Jack, do you want to do you want to talk us through this fight? I mean, it was as a as a fan of both, I expected this outcome. Um, it just was a little bit more maybe brutal than than I had hoped. Um, the speed difference here was significant, and I think that was amplified by the fact that Eddie Wineland typically competes with his hands a lot lower than they should be. Um, the feint that O'Malley um, kind of sold Wineland on before he landed that beautiful straight right was, was probably the, was, was the move of the fight, right? Like seeing that in slow-mo, I think was, was excellent. But yeah, there's not really much to say here. I think it was, it was, it was always going to be fairly predictable. Um, but sad to see my boy Eddie go down like that. Yeah, but I mean, I... As I say, I, I lost my notes, but but I remember that there was a spinning wheel kick that he threw to begin with. And I don't know whether that just clipped Eddie or not, but but even if it did, I mean, Eddie was ducking them relatively well. And then there was the feint and then the bullet right hand. Like, I've, I, I honestly don't know how much that we can say about this. Sean came out, bodied him very, very quickly and swiftly. And it just didn't seem like Eddie was in the fight at all. Sean? Yeah, I think there's some things that Sean did, though, which sort of demonstrates to me why he's, he's a real special talent in that division because I think there's a, there's a lot of people at the moment that could be Eddie Wineland, but I think Sean's sort of approach, especially the way that he'll get reads on people, and if he senses a danger, he's out. Like One thing that I really noticed in that fight was Eddie clipped him with the right hand. Yes. You know, and it was just, it was a significant strike. He didn't rock him or anything like that. But you see in Sean O'Malley's eyes that he registers it and he's like, right, okay, we need to go back to read. And like, he doesn't, he, he has that intelligence to not do the things that like Cody Garbrandt and Old would do. And then he sort of danced out of the pocket again and started coming in with different shots. And then that knockout for me was just so perfect. A lot of people said that, Cody like upstaged him later on and I just think just because of how clean that shot was it, it almost looks surreal the first time I watched it just because with Cody's if he'd missed that I would have been like wow if that had hit anyone it would have knocked him out whereas Sean O'Malley's it looked like he hadn't hit him with anything and those are the those are the really special punches but yeah for, for me the main thing I was worried about Jack to be honest I knew that he'd invested a lot of time in, in Eddie um, and yeah, I was just worried, you know, if you remember his prediction, he was going to spiral in with the pressure. So I didn't know whether to call him afterwards. I, I just wanted to check up in some way, you know, it must be hard seeing, seeing that mustache that, get sure. hit so hard. I'm, I'm hanging in there. I'm hanging in there. <laughs> I think I agree though. The, the one special thing that I saw from, from O'Malley was his, his speed of thought in the fire. Right? So there was one moment where he hit him with a cross and he framed with his left hand before landing a left hook. And just n noticing the read after throwing your right hand in the middle of a combination to then realize that Wineland was about to come back with something big and frame on him to make sure that it doesn't hit you and then to land your, your left hook. Man, like that, that's some special shit. And I get it. I get it. You know, Eddie Wineland probably shouldn't have been in there with him. And although it's Jack's second father, like he just shouldn't be fighting. But <laughs> I mean, he still had to put him away and put him away. He fucking did. Right. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I, I was really impressed and I'm, I'm all aboard that, that hype train now. There's, there's an expression in boxing. If someone has good eyes, it's not used so much in, in MMA, but 
it means someone that has a sense of, of that timing and can read shots better than most other people can. Um, and yeah, Sean O'Malley is definitely one of those people that has really, really good eyes. So I'm excited to see what he does next. Um, I don't want him to go against Cody Garbrandt. I don't think that's good for either what, fighter. What would you guys suggest? Look at, looking at the rankings, um, I've seen Bloody Elbow suggested Rob Font, which would be a nice step up, right? Rob Font is kind of gatekeeper of the top 10. Um, would also mean that it's a striking match for O'Malley as well. Um, other than that, I'm, I'm not the kind of guy who wants prospects to be protected, at least not at this stage. I think, I think O'Malley's relatively proven at this point that he can hang. I would love to see him and Song Yudong. That's a good one. I was thinking Rob Font originally as well, to be honest, though. When I was looking up and down that, that sort of top 15, I, I was thinking Rob Font expert. I could go with Song Yudong as well. I think that's an amazing fight. So I'll throw a couple of names at you. I think if you're talking gatekeepers, you have to give him John Dodson at some point. Oh, God. That would be interesting. I'm not a massive Dodson fan, but I think that probably would still be interesting. I'd like to see Marlon Vera. Yeah, him and Cheeto would be, would be sick. Or give him Nathaniel Wood. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be really, really good. I, I don't That's think it's cool, a great yeah. one for Nathaniel Wood at the minute, but um, I've not even thought of that. They, they typically match winners with winners, right? So I don't think Wood would. Sure. Wood would get a but, look in yet. Maybe they'll do Wood and, wood and Cheeto. Um, I think given that O'Malley has shown some promise of, of potential star power, I think they'll look to get him up the rankings as, as quick as possible. So... Yeah, whilst Wood and Cheeto would be excellent because they're not in the top 15, I think, um, I think they'll get passed up. I'd agree, but O'Malley has been very vocal recently about money, right? And talking about if he wants to fight better guys, he should get paid to do so. I'm fine with that. But if the UFC are going to continue in the same sort of vein that they have been recently, maybe he doesn't get the money he wants. And if he doesn't get the money he wants, well, I... I would imagine somebody like Sean O'Malley would have no problem fighting lesser guys and building up a highlight reel. I mean, True. him versus Nathaniel Wood, I think is a great fight. Like, I really think it's a great fight. Albert Quinones, although he's no Sean O'Malley, he's also long, he's also rangy. Obviously, he's a jiu-jitsu fighter predominantly, but, but I, I think that fight is a good fight. I really do. And, and Nathaniel Wood did, didn't look out of place against John Dodson. Okay, he lost, but, but he didn't look out of place at all. John Dodson got some speed, son. So I would like to see that fight, but... I'm going against my own rule because I don't like putting prospects against each other too early. And I do think Nathaniel Wood is a prospect. I really do. Yeah. I yeah. mean, he's called the prospect, right? So, you know. Um, but yes, we will, uh, we will move on from that fight. Uh, and we'll go to probably the worst fight of the night, to be honest with you. Uh, or at least the worst performance of the night. And that is Chase Hooper versus Alex Caceres. We um, all jumped on the hype train too soon, didn't we? We got to read our words on this one. We do. I mean, uh, Jack went Hooper by submission. Sean and I went Hooper by TKO. And Jesus, I mean, it's just another reason to hate Alex Caceres. Like he's just so hard to get a read on. <laughs> I don't think I've ever Is correctly he? predicted an Alex Caceres. Fight. Oh right. Okay. Maybe apart from like Cron and whatnot. Um, but yeah, stylistically on paper, I just thought, oh, Alex Caceres always gets his back taken. He tends to struggle against dominant grapplers. Yeah, Chase Hooper isn't the, isn't the best wrestler in the world, but once you get hold of him, he'll, he'll probably work his way to his back, right? And I, I actually envisioned a similar finish or, or scenario to what we saw with Herbert Burns and, and Aljo. Mm. But yeah, Chase Hooper's not there yet, unfortunately. I mean, instead, what we got was a Felicia Spencer remake, right? Like, yeah. We essentially got, got the show Pressing. before the actual show. Like, I mean, again, what can we say? He's tough. He's definitely tough. But against... Alex Caceres, who isn't known for his knockout power. Like if you put him in there with somebody that actually bangs, yeah, boy, it's going to be bad. It's going to be really bad. You know, what would you do with Chase now? Because he you've, he had a pretty good run. A rain check. No, you have to take a rain check. He had a pretty good run on the regionals, but do you now send him back to the regionals and say you need no. to go get some more experience? Or... You can't. 
Okay. You can't, you can't send him back to the regionals because there's just too much. There's too much hype that's been put into him. There's too much pr- promotional power and, and marketing dollars that have been spent on him. This whole Ben Askren's dad thing. It, there's too much. <laughs> I mean, we laugh, the, but the strongest marketing campaign though. I mean, let's be <laughs> yeah. fair. I, I feel it. like you could, you could put him back on there. I think you could put him back on the regional seat. Yeah. Keep him on that development contract. Give him a, Drop him into back into Titan or, or LFA, one of those promotions. Ensure that the matchmaker gets a little whisper in his ear about being nice to being nice to him. Ensure he gets his cage time and, and maybe we see him again in another eighteen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Don't put at... him with Sage Northcott's manager that managed his regional. Oh career. Jesus, that is not the exit you want from the UFC. I mean, he's, if we he still just hasn't if we recovered. Look at... If we look at the top fifteen in that, in that featherweight division, I just don't see one fight where he has a chance. Not no, one. no, definitely not at the moment. I I look at most of the roster at featherweight, and there's there's not a lot of fights on there that I would say, oh, he definitely would win that. Um, and that's why I think it's important for him to go elsewhere. I think I would rather not have him spoiled too early, um, and see him get a little bit more experience because it's not just one hole in his game that he needs to tighten up. Right, obviously his striking's not there. He has this fantastic top game, but but no real no real route to get there either. Um, yeah, I would mm. definitely be in favour of, of putting him back on the regional. Yeah, I mean, he pulled guard five times. Five. Yeah, that's it's never it, it. Pulling guard looks yeah. really bad in straight grappling, especially when it's that that consistent. In MMA, it's one of the worst things. It's one of like the most concerning things you can see visually, but yeah, I I didn't like that performance at all. It just reeked of desperation for me, you know? No, I thought yeah. so. Um, yeah, I was just going to just jump on what Jack was saying about pulling guard. I think in MMA, unless you're doing it for a super specific purpose, like Ryan Hall, where it's like he's very clearly got his eyes set on something, he's going for submission straight away, it's an issue. But I thought it was concerning um, that Chase was getting to his positions and his attacks and then couldn't finish from there. So, yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't a good performance, and and I felt I felt genuinely bad for Chase. Like those fifteen minutes were a long fifteen minutes, you know, a long fifteen minutes. Yeah, it was so, one of those fights whereby if if a friend asked me after the fact, um, which fight should he watch and and how can he kind of get a, a read on the event without having to sit through the the full six hours? That's one of those where you can just say, look, look watch the watch the first round. The other two are completely similar, right? There's a, there was a there was a few fights similar to that. I think you can say the same for uh, obviously Amanda Nunes as well, and probably that Brian Kelleher and, and Cody Stamen fight. Um, yeah, just wasn't wasn't much uh, wasn't much. Um, there wasn't many changes in terms of kind of direction in the fight, and it was all just fairly one note. Yeah, we'll move on to um, to a, a fight that we all. Um... I think we all got it wrong. Yeah, we all got it wrong. Mm. Uh, Gerald Mershart yeah. versus Ian Heinch. Like, from the, from the first opening, I'll, I'll take this one. From the first opening, I knew that Gerald Harsh, uh, Mershart was going to lose that fight. Just the speed difference, the athleticism difference. It didn't feel like he could get anything going. You know, he hit Mershart with, I think it was a head kick early, and Mershart blocked it but from then I was like oh boy like this is not going to go well and I actually had to watch the finish a few times I don't know whether he caught the the shot on the glove and it still put him out or put him down or whether he caught it was like a weird shovel punch right cross type shot Uh, very Dan Henderson-esque it was very Dan Henderson-esque yeah but he hit him like a ton of bricks Mershart went down was always looking for a way out I think you know there was no real uh, there was no real attempt to, to wrestle or it was just a lot of turtle and a lot of getting me out of there and, and, and the referee, you know, duly obliged. But, I mean, I don't know if anyone else wants to say anything else, but we morally fucked up that one, you know. We did. I expected we did. a lot more from Mershaw, a lot, lot more. Yeah. He's always bad. been fairly slow um, and he's always been someone who is he's definitely not the most athletic guy on the roster, right? Um, and I think that if you look back across his past fights, he has struggled historically when... Um, against fast starters, people who can, who can put him on the back foot immediately. And, and Heinish obviously came in with an excellent game plan, um, was able to do that and, and, and yeah, got, got an excellent finish. So disappointing as a fan of Mirsha, but um, yeah, if you're a Heinish fan, that was, a, that was an excellent performance from him, especially after dropping his last two. I agree. I can't agree more. I, um, 
Yeah, I mean, there's, there's literally not much, um, not much else I can say, really. You know, I, I expected more. We didn't get it. It is what it is. I, I was, however, quite impressed with, um, I was quite impressed with the, with the Brian Kelleher fight and, and the Cody Stoman fight. I thought that, um, I thought that we saw some new wrinkles to, to Kelleher. However, we did see some, uh, sorry, we definitely didn't see new wrinkles to Kelleher. We saw some new, new wrinkles with, uh, with Cody Stoman, but we didn't really see much from Brian Kelleher other than the things we already knew about him. Right. Jack, do you want to speak a little bit on that one? Yeah. Um, I probably undersold Cody Stoneman's striking a little bit before this fight. Um, I used to think of him as, as being slightly more one-dimensional, but his overall striking game is actually pretty nice. Like, he keeps it fairly varied. He moves really, really, really well. Um, and that's pretty much all he needed, right? Um, Brian Keller has best when he's pressuring and he can get people on the back foot, um, kind of clubbing them down with, with, uh, with combinations primarily focused on hooks. But, um, yeah, I felt like Brian Kelleher probably went to the well a little bit too much um, with the left hook, obviously given the fact that that's what, that's what got him the victory uh, a couple of weeks back. But, yeah, really, really impressive performance from Cody Stamen, dominated in, in pretty much every, every aspect. Um, it was only kind of late in the third when, when he started to slow down a bit did we see kind of um, Kelleher start to change the pace a little bit and have some success. But given everything that, that's gone on um, before the fight with Cody Stamen, I, I, for one, was, was delighted to see him get the win. Yeah, I mean, big, big, big props to Cody Stamen for one, even taking the fight, yeah. and two, to then keep together enough to to put the performance on that he did. Sean, what do you what do you want to talk about for this fight? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that I underestimated about Cody was um, that defensively, striking wise, he's really, really strong. Um, another thing, just to tip my um, hat to you, Harry. Um, I think I watched the fight with Hunter um, as your and sort of just got. Um, pulled into the fact that Kelleher got a really good knockout, you know, but it almost seems obvious when you think of how good Cody is defensively, that if you put him in the same fight, he just, it seemed like Brian could just not touch him. And even, the thing that impressed me was even when you could see Cody was tiring slightly and Brian was putting the pressure on, even then, you know, he kept present, he kept sort of defensively wary. Um, which, like Jack said, on top of everything that's happened to that guy, is so, so impressive. I agree. I felt like Kelleher, he's just missing 5%, 10% from his striking game. You know, it feels like his, his own defensive capabilities are not there. He, require, he, he relies more on, on his ability to pressure. I thought that very quickly Cody Staman got reads on Kelleher's footwork, on his timing, on his movement, and he managed to... To, to counter those really well and then provide his own offense. The thing that, that I like about Staman, and I think I, I, I mentioned in the podcast before, was he has quite a basic approach. And I, I don't mean that in a negative way. He keeps it simple. He keeps his feint simple. He uses athleticism. And he always is threatening some form of grappling. And I think that helps his, his, his attacking offense, uh, sorry, his striking offense a lot. Whereas, as Sean touched on before, you know, his his striking defense is is phenomenal and and his footwork is good. I think his gas tank is something that definitely needs work. You know, uh, you know, you're not going to see him in any five round fight soon. Expecting him to last the course if if a three round fight with with you know anyone is is going to give you gas is going to leave you gassed at the end. But I mean, look, I'm I'm really impressed with with Cody Staman. I think he showed me some things that that make me make me feel quite confident about his future. Um, Jack, anything to add? He'd be a good test for O'Malley, actually. Um, but no, I think you guys have, have summarised that well. Um, it was a really, really good performance, especially given everything else that was going on. I mean, I think, to your O'Malley call-out, I, I don't know that I agree. The reason why I don't know if I agree is because, although it was three years ago, Tom Dukenois really showed how you beat him. And you beat him with accurate volume. And I think... Cody Staman is quite small. He's like 5'6", five, 5'7". Five, Sean O'Malley's 5'11", 6 foot. I think the range would be difficult. I think O'Malley's range control is, is far, far superior. Um, and I think that just, just overall, O'Malley has the power to hurt people. Um, and obviously, Brian Kelleher does, but he also has the accuracy to hurt people as well, right? Yeah, I think 
I think you make some good points. I think that what why I think it would be a good matchup for Sean is that it would be by far the best grappler he has fought. Yes. I think today today it's Jose Albert Quinones who isn't anything special. I think Stamen's easily one of the stronger wrestlers in the division, probably just sitting behind Aljo, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so stylistically, I think it would give um, it'd be a new look for O'Malley, get a chance to maybe show off some of his uh, his, his jiu-jitsu. Um, and whilst it's not against the rank, ranked opponent, I think that everyone, everyone rates Stamen quite highly, right? So it could yeah. be a good option. So uh, I have to congratulate you, Jack. You picked Staman versus, uh, via UD, which, which is... Good pick. Uh, Jack also got the next one as well. He Shooter Mackie, Mackie my boy. Versus VAKO. Let's talk a little bit about that fight. Uh, Sean, do you want to talk a little bit about that fight? I actually enjoyed this fight. It was a good fight. Yeah, I really enjoyed it as well. Um, I think the biggest thing for me going in was I thought Charles Bird was the more well-rounded fighter. And I think in some ways I still do think that. I think my concern with Charles Bird is that when the tables are turned and when he's under pressure, he does have a tendency to fold. You know, it was like, like we said in the sort of pre, pre-fight pre um, show, if you look at his fight against Darren Stewart, like he's really hurting Darren Stewart. Sorry, who is Darren Stewart? Um, <laughs> sorry, have I just invented another fight? I think his name is Darren Stewart. Uh, he was a guy he fought on the regionals, I think. <laughs> he researched deeper into his career. Um, Charles Stewart. His name is Charles Bird. No, no, Charles Bird and Darren Charles Stewart. Bird. Right, and Darren just got Stewart. This... Yeah, Darren Stewart. You was it was coming through as Daniel Stewart, and now I've got this image of Darren Stewart moonlighting as a steward at, at Wembley Arena. But Mate, wow. um, this, is, this is phenomenal. You were close enough. This is absolutely Incredible. phenomenal. Sean, well, there you go. Really you know. it. <laughs> really, I'm trying, guys. I'm trying my best. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so whatever the person's name is, I think Charles Bird does have a tendency to sort of um, fold under pressure. And I think it happened again here. I think that there were times, um, it was a very competitive sort of back and forth fight, but I don't think there is any quit in Matthew Patolo at all. You know, he's, he's sort of cut from that Hawaiian cloth and none of those guys are ever looking for a way out. Um, just a little like technical bit I liked and this was a bit of like octopus guard which you don't see too often Yes, uh, from Charles Bird. Um, you got to love that. <laughs> it was great. I actually thought that, I mean fuck the finish, I thought the grappling was really fun in this fight. Yeah. Really, yeah. really fun. It was back and forth, high scramble rate and for two big guys that's not stuff that you see a lot but I was really impressed with that. I think the only thing that I would say that, you know, maybe myself and Sean should have looked at a little bit further and probably the tail of the fight was, was obviously our boy, Daniel Stewart. Um, had, 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 had <laughs> I still out. don't know what this guy's name is. Now. Darren so Stewart. So just That's Darren. his name. Okay. <laughs> He's a UK fighter, fought for Cage Warriors. No, I know who he is. I just don't know his name. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, so, so he knocked him out uh, in round two. Edmund Shabazian absolutely ran through him like a, a bat out of hell. So it's now three knockouts and three losses in his last three. Um, now, you know, that's not, that's not the best place to be if you're 36 years old, you know, in your, in your 17th MMA fight. But I don't know. Jack yeah, beats to it. So. He's, he's not Cody Garbrandt. If you, get, if you lose three times consecutively by knockout in the UFC, you're getting your pink slip, right? So um, I think so. I think, yeah, coming in, I thought, whilst Mackie Patolo's last fight, um, which was at welterweight, was really, really bad. I think it was pretty clear the, the weight cut had impacted him. And I think that his performance on the contender series at middleweight was actually really promising. So mm-hmm. my hope for this was that he would be able to weather the early wrestling storm and, 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 and kind of survive Charles Bird over the distance. Um, yeah, it's been a bit of a shame for Charles Bird because I think he's, he's quite a fun um, offensive grappler. But oh, yeah. kind of kind of has a tendency to melt in fights. So um, it's a bit of a shame there. But... Great win for Maki Patolo. Absolutely. I didn't think Maki Patolo looked too too undersized, to be honest with you. No. He said he was cutting down from 210 pounds. So, fuck knows how he made well to weight. Me. All that tuna Maki. Man. Mate. Sure. That's like what Sean's going to be cutting to make 77. <laughs> that would be it. After this quarantine, trust me. Oh, my Lord. Okay. So, we'll move on to... Um, 
to one of the the best jiu-jitsu displays and probably one of the worst striking displays I've ever seen. And we'll go for Herbert Burns versus Evan Dunham. First off, Evan Dunham, you're done, mate. Please. I, I think you had a great career in the UFC. I really enjoyed watching all of your fights, but please don't do it again. Please. Like, cutting that extra five pounds, I don't think it was worth it. You know, you have all the experience in the world, but, and, you know, I'm, I'm kind of saying this for rhetoric, but I also kind of mean it. Like, I don't like telling fighters or whoever to, to quit, but, man, I mean, Herbert Burns, he walked forward like a tree. You know, his arms didn't move. His body didn't really move. But when he got a hold of, of, of Evan Dunham, it was, it, was, it was very, very slick. That Henzo Gracie retirement, uh, return from retirement-esque takedown, took his back and it was over quickly, right? Quickly. Jack, do you want to talk us through the jiu-jitsu a little bit? Yeah, it was really, really slick. So you could see Herbert um, set off in the fight, trying to attack Evan's body. Obviously, Evan's last two fights, he, he had lost via uh, knees to the body. So pretty smart strategy there. Um, there were some relatively poor attempts from, from Herbert to get this fight to the ground shortly after that. I think he was, uh, he was fighting with urgency given the injury he sustained to his, his foot or his toes. I don't know what you want to call that, but it was, was pretty gross. Um, and then Herbert made a really slick adjustment. In, instead of shooting for the takedown, he decided to come up on the double unders, hit that famous Henzo Gracie broomstick. Um, from there, was able to, to take Evans back. Um, as Sean was referring to earlier, he had the body triangle actually on the on the wrong side, typically, um, but was able to flip it over, sunk sunk the choke in shortly thereafter, and and yeah, really really impressive. I think Harry, you're spot on. I think Evan Dunham, um, his kind of potential as a as a as a top level fighter, he's definitely over. Um, but he's he's a very good grappler. I know he'd been subbed once in the UFC before that. I know he's got a win over Boogeyman Martinez in straight jiu-jitsu, So I think. Not only did Herbert finish him, but the fact he was able to submit him was, uh, was definitely a big statement. Mm, Sean? Yeah, I think um, just to add something that you said before, Harry, with the um, Aljo fight in terms of him having to almost belly down to get into position so he could lock that rear naked in. Um, that was another thing with this Herbert Burns fight, which to me sort of signaled that he's got a very elite ground game. Yes. Um, I think that sort of decision-making where most of the time, either you get guys, they'll just abandon the choke and come on top of the mound. The fact that he bellied down and rolled all the way through so he could catch that choke in transition, that's some super, super high-level shit right there. That's so, so good. Um, so I was, I was really impressed from a grappling perspective. And with my pick, I think I just overestimated um, how much Evan Dunham's experience will play in this one. To be honest, it was a complete shutout once he got it to the ground. I mean, I've recorded it here that you picked Herbert Burns by submission. Yeah, but I think it was in the third round, was it, or later? Uh, on I didn't. Time. I didn't put rounds on uh, on on the actual oh. podcast itself. But but Jack, you went Burns by unanimous decision, so you can get fucked. Um, obviously, me and Sean went for for Burns by submission. Uh, yeah, I, don't I completely remember. take back everything I just said. <laughs> I said first round, broomstick. Well, just so you know, Daniel Stewart and that is staying in. <sighs> um, we will go on now to probably one of my fights of the night, to be honest, or my performance of the night. Anyway, this was, for me, this was a really high-level MMA fight. A really high-level MMA fight. I really enjoyed it. Um, this is obviously UCA Formiga versus... Uh, Alex Perez, um, Sean is the only person to pick it right. Uh, Jack had Formiga by submission, and and I had Formiga by unanimous decision. But Jesus, like this was this was the tale of one thing, one thing, and that was the leg kick. Right? Obviously, he got the finish by the leg kick, but actually, this whole fight, if it had gone a little bit further than it did, would have been told by the leg kick. You know, Alex Perez just finished every single combination by a leg kick, and. And Jose Formiga didn't. He didn't check them and, and we see what happens, right? Sean, what have you got? Yeah, I think um, we've already spoken about the leg, but those low leg kicks, you know, they played a role higher up the card. I think even in MMA, just as a sport at, at the moment, if you don't check those, you are completely out of the fight. You know, you're just completely, completely done. You, you can only take two, maybe three, you know, a push and then your leg's off. And I think especially for someone like... Um, Formiga that sort of 
not necessarily relies, but he has good defensive footwork. You know, he usually, you know, moves around and he's not directly in front of the person, whereas obviously Alex Perez is sort of the polar opposite of that. You know, he trades a lot more and he's very aggressive in your face. So for Alex Perez, whether that was something technically he's added in specifically for Formiga or not, it definitely helps um, sort of chop down Formiga and take away um, the sort of good qualities he has in that style. Absolutely. I was just very impressed by Alex Perez. I thought he just looked you know, half a percent quicker. His head movement was wonderful. I thought some of his defensive footwork was really nice. I just, I just thought it was a good performance, but but equally, I thought it was a decent performance by UCF Formiga. You know, he got his own shots off. He got his own offense off. Defensively, he was okay in the pocket. It was just the leg kicks. Like, it really was. Jack? Yeah, you guys have, have, have summarized this perfectly. Um, I think before this, we, me and Harry were saying that whilst we've seen some promise from Alex Perez, he was missing that real breakthrough performance, and, and this was definitely it, right? Um, mm. as, a, as a big fan of uh, uh, Formiga, I would have hoped to have seen him pursue the takedown a little bit. Obviously, that was, was scuppered by the fact that, that his leg was absolutely barbecued. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a bit of a sad one for Formiga, right? He's, he's 35 now, coming off the back of three losses. Um, probably never going to see that elusive title shot that, that he deserved. Um, but on the flip side, um, I think that a fight between Alex Perez and Brando, Brandon Moreno probably, probably will serve as a, as a fairly nice number one contenders fight. So... Not, not all doom and gloom. I like that fight. I like that fight a lot. Brandon Moreno, Alex Perez, Sean? Yeah, I'd love that. I think um, especially the way those two sort of clash style-wise, I think that'd be awesome. All right, so we'll move on to um, the only sure pick that we thought we had. And boy, did we fucking destroy this pick. Menafield by KO is what we all had. And... Yeah, Jesus Christ. I mean, to be honest, to be honest, when he landed that right hook that, that smashed up the orbital bone, I thought, mm, okay, this could, uh, this could show. But I think, actually, that our mate, De- uh, Devin, must have, uh, must have watched the last podcast. Must have. Because he took Jack's words and he fucking butchered them. You know, Jack was saying he looks fearful in there. You know, he looks, he doesn't look like he wants to be there. And Devin Clark was like, yeah, cool, bro. Let me just take this monster for three rounds, wear him down and, and win the fight. Jack, go on. Yeah, he, he still did look a little bit tentative early, early on. <laughs> oh, <laughs> listen to him. Listen to him. Early on, I'm still saucy, yeah. I'm still sorry. I'm going to eat my words. I'm going to eat my words here, though. But one thing that I thought was awesome was Devin Clark having his dad in his corner. And given the fact that there was no audience, it was really really kind of like loud hearing his dad just bellow, bellow instructions and encouragement, which was, um, which I thought was a kind of fantastic addition to the card. Um, yeah, really, really good performance from Devin Clark. After our podcast last week, I went back and watched um, one of many fields fights from the contender series against a guy called Daniel Jolly, who washed out of the UFC rather unspectacularly. But in that fight, he was able to not only kind of stun Alonso with some shots on the feet, but he was able to get him down fairly easily. Um, I thought, yeah, there was still some um, concerning signs for Devon Clark early on. Um, I still thought he looked a little bit gun shy in the early exchanges. But w- with that being said, this was easily his best performance to date. Um, not only did he endure far more punishment than he has in other fights, but his striking looked way better than we've seen. Yeah. Um, and obviously, even though he couldn't lean on um, lean on his takedowns until later in the fight. Um, he was still able to to beat a fairly impressive prospect. One thing that um, I noticed actually going back and doing some studying before the fight is I watched Alonzo Manyfield versus Daniel Jolly from the Contender Series. Um, And Daniel Jolly turned in a fairly similar performance, but ultimately ended up losing due to an eye injury. Um, So whilst my pick was uh, Manyfield and with confidence, I did give Devin Clark a bit more of a shot um, than I had initially thought. But yeah, really, really good performance. Love the fact that his dad was in his corner, bellowing and, and shouting encouragement. Um, and overall, I thought this was a pretty good fight, right? I think there was so many good finishes and, and performances on the card. I think that um, this one and, and maybe the Mackie Patolo and Alex Perez as well might get overlooked. But, but overall, a really fun scrap. I agree. I mean, I think that we saw some, 
some excellent defensive wrestling from Devin Clark. We saw a really good gas tank from Devin Clark. We saw some good defensive head movement and, and you know, good defensive striking or striking defense, should I say. But other than that, I mean, I think Alonzo Menafield has all of the makings to be a really good fighter. He's clearly got crazy power. He's clearly got crazy athleticism. You know, he hit Devin Clark with essentially one shot the whole fight and smashed up his orbital bone. Um, really good takedown defense as well. That was really probably the, defense. that's yeah. what I was most impressed with in many field. But what he didn't have is a gas tank, right? So if he can improve on that and maybe improve on his offensive wrestling, because it felt like a lot of the time he was leaning on Devin Clark on the cage to try and wear Devin out. But Devin was absolutely fine there. His head positioning was really good. He was fighting for his underhooks. He was getting his pummels. He was, you know, he was then trying to chain his own wrestling together. And maybe Sean, I'm going to bat it over to you in a second to, to, give, to give me a cage wrestling clinic. But, but I felt like if Menafield had tried to chain his wrestling attacks together a little bit more, maybe you would have had a bit more success. But equally, look, if you've got the, the superpower that is Devin Clark's father in your corner, it's going to be tough to lose, right? So, so Sean, take us away on, on what your thoughts were of the fight. Yeah, I think you guys sort of caught the essence of what happened there pretty well. I think for me, like you say with Alonso, it's not a question of athleticism or natural talent or anything else. I think it's just, it's the gas tank, but I also think it's just some technical issues as well. That I think that there were quite a few moments where he was sort of stuck up against the fence and, you know, he couldn't really get his, his sort of attacks off. Um, kind of like a, like Anthony Pettis sort of syndrome where he's getting caught up against the fence quite a lot and he's not necessarily getting taken down loads, but he's still not getting off and that's obviously still limiting um, what he can sort of land at, at his optimal range, basically. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think he has some... I think he has some great potential. It's just, like you say, a gas tank and some technical issues, but nothing that can't be fixed. Um, but I thought it was a great performance from Devin Clark as well. I think that maybe this Metafield performance will age quite well because if you've just been running through people and not really been truly tested over three rounds in by, by, a, by a decent fighter, then you're not going to know. But now he's seen the holes and, and the holes have been broadcast to millions of people. So... So hopefully Alonzo Menafield will come back and we'll, he'll show us some new wrinkles and he'll show us an improved fighter. Um, Sean, I'd like to get your pick on fight of the night, if you will. I was thinking about that then. I think for me, it may have to be um, Tolo versus Bird for me. Um, okay. I, just, I thought it was a good fight. I also thought that just grappling-wise, like it's already been said, like there was some high-level grappling thrown in there as well. Um, as well as just a good sort of old-fashioned scrap. So, yeah, I love that one. Jack? Yeah, I, I agree with Sean. Definitely Maki Patolo, Charles Bird, just because it gave us quite a few different looks, right? Um, but I did really enjoy Devin Clark and Alonzo Manyfield, although it was very sloppy and um, very typical of what to expect uh, at like heavyweight. It was still a lot of fun. So my, my pick of fight of the night is going to be Alex Perez, UC Formiga. I just really enjoyed that fight. I thought it was a great fight. It gave us everything that we that, that I personally wanted. Um, and I thought it was really good to see a high-level MMA fight between two veterans that, okay, UCA Formiga, as you say, is probably not going to get that title shot now. But these guys know how to fight, and they did fight well, you know. Uh, Jack, could you give us your performance of the night? Maybe Alex Perez. Um, not, to, not to kind of take an easy option there just because you were speaking about him, but like um, he needed the big breakthrough performance. This was easily uh, probably the second best guy he's ever fought. And, and whilst it was competitive, um, it was still kind of a clear-cut win. So he, he would mm -hmm. take it in my books. Sean, performance of the night, please. Oh, it's got to be Sean O'Malley for me. I think even I agree. though... I think even though um, the sort of standard of opponent wasn't as high as was Cody Garbrandt um, or Aljamain Sterling. I think just for me, that knockout was so pitch perfect. Um, I think if we're going pure, just based on pure technique, you'd have to go with Aljamain Sterling. But yeah, there was just something about that knockout that I'm going to remember for a very long time. So yeah, Sean O'Malley for me all the way. Performance of the night for me goes to Sean O'Malley as well. I just think it was such a clinical performance. It was just one minute, 55 seconds of just dominance. And, and we didn't see that really. I mean, we saw that with Aljamain, obviously, but, but I'll give Aljamain a chance in a second. 
I'm going to offer Jack, I'm going to offer you finish of the night. So this could be a, a KO Ooh. or a submission. I'm torn between Aljo and Sean, just because Sean's was beautiful, but I kind of expected it. Whereas Aljo's was extremely sudden when we all expected this to be a, to be a very competitive three round. So I'm going to go with the surprise factor and, and I'll take Aljo. I'm going to take Aljo as well. And I'm going to take Aljo simply because I agree. I expected Sean to get knocked out, but to put, to put the performance that Aljo did against somebody who's, who's a very, very good fighter in, in Corey Sandhagen is, is extremely impressive. I would also put a shout for Alex Perez. A leg kick TKO is rare at any time, but against the veteran like Yusei Formiga, a leg kick TKO is extremely rare. So, I would also give, give Alex Perez a nod. Sean, who have you got for me? Finish of the night. All right, so finish of the night is going to be Sean O'Malley, but on the condition that I can change what I've just said um, for the performance of the night to Aljamain Sterling. I think whatever you say about that fight, we all had... Don't make that say to me, Harry. I think whatever we say, we all had a super competitive high-level fight between Corey Sandhagen and Aljamain Sterling. Okay, I don't think any of us expected... For Aljamain to just you know walk across there and just make a cake walk out of it, you know, yep. it was, no one had any idea you know where that was going to go, and Aljo made it look easy. So I'll change it to performance of the night, Aljo, and then finish of the night goes to that super clean knockout for me. All right. Well, any closing thoughts on the card, Jack, Sean, Sean, go first. I think again, I'm loving these cards. Um, where there's no audience, to be honest. I think it adds a bit a bit more atmosphere. I also think, and this is just a theory, but I think some of the guys are finding it easier to perform out there because there isn't the sway of the crowd and there isn't the, the pressure. It is that that old-fashioned thing of they are just in a fight with each other, you know, even though there's obviously the eyes watching on TV. So, yeah, just that aspect um, I've been really enjoying. Um, and like, like we said before, I think the smaller cage has played a huge role in all these fights as well. Jack? Yeah, I love the card. I felt, I felt we all had um, quite high expectations for it beforehand and, and it definitely delivered and, and potentially surpassed that. Um, I think had this had a slightly better and more competitive main event, then this is one of those cards that, that could have been potentially in the run for, for one of the events of the year. Um, but yeah, that was never going to happen when we've got women's featherweight at the top. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think that this was this wasn't quite as good of a card as as the previous one, but I thought it was a a really cracking card actually. And and in comparison to the the next couple of cards that we've got coming up, it's uh, it it was a phenomenal card. If we just take a, a quick look ac uh, along at the next couple of fight cards, we've got. Uh, Jessica I versus Cynthia Calvillo. And, and let's just quickly run down the, the fights there. Obviously, Jessica I and Cynthia Calvillo is, is an interesting choice for main event. We've then got Marvin Vittori, Carl Robertson, which is obviously a rebooked fight. Ray Borg versus Marab Divashvili. Uh, I could see Marab probably wrestle fucking Ray Borg for, for three rounds. Andre sure. Feely, Charles Jordan is an interesting fight. And from there, it kind of just falls off, to be honest. Um, we've then got. Uh, Curtis Blades versus Volkov which Jesus the, the the notable fights on there is Jim Miller's back again Clay Guida's is having a fight for some reason <laughs> oh uh, great yeah oh. Lyman Good versus Bilal Mohammed should be a good scrap uh, Josh Emmett Shane Burgos is a really really good scrap I'm really That's looking forward to that one uh, Roxanne Madaferi versus Lauren Murphy for who could take the most amount of damage I guess uh, <laughs> And then we've got Curtis Blades, Alexander Volkov, which is likely to be terrible. Um, we then move on to, to Dustin Poirier, Dan Hooker, which is actually a phenomenal fight. A phenomenal really, really fight. Good. I think we'll, that's, a, that's a bit of me, that fight. That's a bit of me as well. I'd actually like to do a breakdown of that regardless. But let, let, let's see. We've then got Mike Perry and Mickey Gall, which for all intents and purposes is probably either Mickey Gall is going to get knocked the fuck out or he's going to armbar Mike Perry. Mike Have Perry's in seen... camp with his girlfriend. Yeah. She's, she's, she's got she's he's in his pad work. She, she's a bit of a Freddy Roach, you know? I wouldn't, I wouldn't be <laughs> too surprised if there's a big knockout there. Jesus Christ. 
I don't even want to talk to Sean for the rest of this podcast. If you that try. may be the worst response to quarantine training out of all the UFC fighters that I've seen. And I love Mike Perry, but I've never heard of anyone like this. Because this, t- this is twice nearly this has happened where he, he just hires his girlfriend as a coach. You know, it's not even fair on them. It's crazy. Hey, man, Corona's got everyone's budget strapped, all right? He's got to do what he's got to do. He no, has. Right. You're right. Ian Heinish gets a quick turnaround against Brendan Allen. Aspen that's, Lad versus... That's a great scrap. It is a great scrap. Sarah McMahon and Aspen Lad. <laughs> Jesus, I feel like this could be a tough out for Aspen Lad, to be honest. She's a dominant... She's a good grappler, but Sarah McMahon's a really good grappler. Good double leg, good wrestling, you know, sort of average striking. Jennifer Myers back, Alexo Grasso's back. John Vellante gets Marie Green. <laughs> Jesus. We've then got Lewis Pena. I really like Lewis Pena's fight. So Lewis Pena versus Karma Worthy. That should be a good fight. But then, boy, oh boy, have we got some serious fights after that. UFC 251, July 11th. Usman versus Gilbert Burns. Jesus Christ. What a fight that is. Volkanovski, Max Holloway 2. Great fight. Piotr Jan versus Jose Aldo. What a fight Love that it. is. Love it. Jessica Andrade, Rose Namajunas 2. Great fight. Paige Van Zandt versus Amanda Ribas. That's a barn burner. Pedro Munoz versus Frankie Edgar. Jesus Christ, Frankie Edgar is going to get pounded into the floor. Volkan Ozdemir versus Yuri Prashaka, who's the Ryzen light heavyweight champion. Oh. Or was. Shamil Abderakimov versus Cyril Gagne. I mean, they're putting Shamil in there to be, you know, a sacrificial lamb for Cyril Gagne, but whatever it is, what it is. And then we've got two bantamweights that I've never heard of. But boy, those first, yeah. you know, seven fights are absolutely phenomenal. No, those are absolutely ridiculous. I was a bit worried sort of hearing this week about Obviously, quite a few of the UFC stars sort of refusing to fight until the pay sort of brought up. But, oh, my Lord, when this card was brought out, it, it put those fears to rest, for sure. Absolutely. What a card. I mean, I can, uh, you, can expect, you can expect some breakdowns coming. Um, probably not for the Cynthia Ray Calvio fight, but I think there's some decent <laughs> enough fights on the Blades and Volkov card. I, I really want to break down that Poirier Hooker fight and maybe we'll do a, a post-fight breakdown for that. But my God, all roads to July 11th, a month from, a month tomorrow. And Jesus Christ, I can't wait for that one. Um, it looks like Figueredo Benavidez 2 has been announced as well. That's July 18th. Um, and it also looks like main event, for July 25th, Darren Will. Darren, Darren Will. Oh, Jesus, I've done a Sean. Um, <sighs> it seems that Robert Whitaker, Darren Till is confirmed for July 25th. That's going to be a barn burner. Um, but yeah, those are the fights coming up for the next sort of month or so. So expect some breakdowns coming. Um, as always, if you've enjoyed the podcast, please do uh, like, subscribe, share, give us a review, tell your nan to listen to it, all of that good stuff. Um, Jack unfortunately has had to j- just drop off but Sean it's been an absolute pleasure thank you very much for your time and, and I will see you soon thank you for having me again mate excellent